People either don't know or don't understand the role of a guardian ad litem, or may have plenty of misconceptions about what the process entails. They might believe that the process is biased against gender, or that no one's going to listen to them, or that their thoughts simply don't matter. None of that is true. But if you don't have the process laid out straightforward and true, it's going to end really badly. So when a guardian ad litem is appointed, my understanding is they have a, a number of different tasks within their, within their checklist that's gonna help with their investigation, right? And one of them is to actually conduct an interview with the critical parties to the case. So when does that interview happen? What, what happens during it? So when you have an interview with a guardian ad litem, it usually transpires uh, sometime after the appointment. Um, the guardian ad litem, if you're represented by an attorney, will first, first reach out to that attorney and ask them um, if they're allowed to make contact with your client. Um, your attorney will reach out to you, let them know, guardian ad litem's getting ready to conduct an interview. I've given them permission to talk with you. Feel free to have that interview with them. The guardian ad litem will reach out they will have a conversation with you. They'll ask simple questions um, as to you know, your relationship with the child, your home, uh, how, how things are, are, are going in your home. What are the difficulties that you have? What are the successes that you have? How does the minor child flourish? How does the uh, minor child uh, maybe recede when it comes to interactions with different parties? And I usually advise my clients that you are going to want to come up with a list of talking points. Sometimes that helps the most because you're going to want to get the most important information out and not so much focus on what the opposing party is doing or what they have done, but the idea to come back and say, these are the things in my home. These are the things that are happening in my home. Um, this is our routine. This is our schedule. And this was what works and this is what doesn't work. And keep it very conversational. But in the same regard, understand that again, this person does not represent you. They represent the interests of the child. So it sounds like a, a component of the interview is also potentially a home visit. Yes. Right? What is that? When does that happen? The guardian litem will schedule that with you. It may not happen immediately. And in fact, sometimes with a guardian litem with a phone call um, or maybe even a Zoom meeting, uh, they may decide that they don't want to do a home visit or a home visit's not quite necessary. Being perfectly glib, um, lawyers often refer to a, uh, a home visit as being the proctological equivalent in the legal <laughs> in the legal sphere. What are they talking about when they say that? So the guardian litem is going to dive deep into all of the things that are in your background. They're going to talk to neighbors. They're going to talk to school teachers. They're going to talk to principals. They're going to talk to the children's friends and family. Um, they might talk to a cousin or an aunt or some other relative of yours. They're also going to be doing that on the other side, but they are going to have a deep understanding of the functionality in your home and how that works. So as much as this can be fraught with emotion, you had said one of the one of the great tips you give to your clients is to have a kind of a talking points checklist to try to keep them in line. Correct. Right? Why is it important to have that outline? So it's easy to um, get off script when you're trying to talk to a guardian ad litem. One thing you have to take into consideration is, although the court has appointed the guardian ad litem and the guardian ad litem's best interests are the children, you're also partially paying for that guardian ad litem. Mm -hmm. And you're paying for them by the hour. That's a good point. So it's easy to get off script and to want to uh, bash the other party or talk historically um, what is wrong with that person and why they're not a good parent. and what. It, it's so incredibly easy to want to fight for your child because you're so incredibly impassioned uh, into that issue. The guardian ad litem isn't so much looking to have a uh, confrontational session with you about everything that your spouse, your ex-spouse, your, your partner, your ex-partner has done. They're looking at how your home is run and how that child flourishes in that home. I understand that one of the critical factors, uh, one of the statutory factors that a guardian ad litem assesses is one party's willingness to support and co-parent with the other party. So it sounds like one of the checklist items would be uh, in conversation about the other party to kill them with kindness. Is that accurate? Absolutely. I think it's important to be able to touch on those points and say what historically has worked and what has not worked, but bringing it back around to the child, understanding 
those are the child's best interests. What works for that child? When placement, pickup, and drop-off is working, what's not working about it? Um, have those kinds of conversations and keep to the checklist, not so much about, I hate him, I hate her, I don't like this, I don't like that, but come back into, this is what does work in our home. And this is how my child does and how my child is successful in their day-to-day -day activities. Now, guardian ad litem is appointed as an order of the court, right? That is correct. Well, does a parent have to cooperate with a court-appointed guardian ad litem? It would be in your best interest to cooperate with a guardian ad litem, yes. What would be the ramifications if, if guardian ad litem tried to coordinate the interview, tried to coordinate the home visit, and someone just decided, I'm going to ignore this person? It definitely wouldn't appear very well in court because the guardian ad litem is going to be able to communicate that with the judge. A judge doesn't get the opportunity to come into your home and to take a look at the situation. It does, he doesn't get the chance to come and visit and see how well the, school, uh, how well the child is doing at school. Mm -hmm. The problem is that when you lose that connection between the guardian ad litem and the court, you're cutting off your own voice. So let's remember. A guardian ad litem is a neutral third party appointed by the court in the best interest of the child. Having the right attorney within this process matters, not only to lay down the legal framework for the process, but also to protect you from you.